Thank you, Oliver. You can still hear me okay, I hope. Yep, we can hear you. Great. Um, so thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to the group. Um, I, I'll start off by saying I'm not an expert in neurological disorders. Uh, I'm a stem cell biologist, uh, but I do have an interest in disease modeling, precision disease modeling. And uh, we kind of got interested in DERK 1A through a kind of circuitous route. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a little bit today about um, how we approach rare diseases at the Jackson Lab, our new cell modeling program, how that fits in with our traditional uh, work with animal models, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done with Dirk One A. I've, uh, although Oliver, I'm sure you, you have a, you and your wife have a background in, in biomedical research. I'm going to assume there isn't too much of a background for the rest of the audience. Um, so the platform that we use in a lot of this research are pluripotent stem cells, and pluripotent stem cells, which were first discovered in the late 1990s. Uh, really have become a transformative platform in research and medicine. And uh, the, the thing about them is uh, we can propagate them indefinitely in culture and they can give rise to uh, virtually any sort of tissue. Uh, and these key properties uh, are captured in this next slide, which we will go on to shortly. Uh, so here are the key, this is really all you need to know. These are cells we can grow and multiply indefinitely in vitro. All the time they're growing, they maintain a normal genetic makeup. Um, we can turn them into any type of body tissues and even germ cells at high frequency under a range of conditions. So what this means is that they give us an indefinitely renewable source of any human tissue for use in research and in cell therapy. Um, and as I say, the, the availability of these cells really causing a revolution in biomedicine. Um, this is from a review I wrote with my colleagues not long after uh, we and others discovered the cells. And we made a lot of bold prediction about what we were gonna do with them. We were gonna model human development. We we're gonna do functional human genomics, drug discovery and toxicology, cell transplantation therapy. And at this stage, Marcus, this was- Can you sorry? share? We just had a comment from the audience. Uh, if you can share the presentation in full screen. Like okay, I will do that now. Just bear with me. I, I'm hoping I, for some reason I couldn't hear you when I did that, but let me try it again. Okay, can you say something for me? Yeah, can you hear us from here? Perfect, perfect, we're all good. Okay, so hopefully this is better now. So these are some of the predictions we made way back then. At that stage, it was what the software engineers call vaporware. Uh, meaning uh, something that's advertised but not really yet available. Uh, but it's remarkable for me looking back now to see how many of these things have either come to fruition or are on the way. Um, this just shows the growth of our field. Uh, we're going to be talking about making disease models today, and you can see how that's grown. And although it's not directly relevant uh, to what we're talking about today, there are now over 100 trials around the world, phase one, early phase two, in a range of uh, indications uh, all based on pluripotent stem cells. And um, there's been a number of technologies that have really uh, uh, kind of accelerated what we can do with these cells. There are all sorts of functional assays. I'll show you some of those. There's genomics, there's imaging, and all of these enable us to apply these cells in a whole range of, of uh, different applications, including patient-specific disease modeling and, and uh, drug development. And today we're lucky because we have so many uh, toolkits, especially when we come to developmental disorders like dirk one a syndrome. So we have the stem cells, we have models of the embryo, we have high throughput and high content screens that enable us to evaluate loads of compounds or, or different manipulations of the cells. We have this new powerful technology for doing genetic manipulation of cells and making models. We have single cell omics, which has given us a lot of insight. And importantly for what we're talking about today, we now have much more information about the molecular biology of early development in primates and in the mouse. And that's giving us a lot of insight into some of these developmental disorders. 
On top of that, we now have discovery platforms using sequencing, so we know a lot more about human developmental genetics and, and developmental disorders. So a wonderful toolkit. Um, with all these uh, in vitro tools, you know, um, you may be familiar with this new FDA legislation that says you, you no longer, it's no longer mandatory to test uh, uh, drugs or on animals before a clinical trial. And so the question is now, um, do we really, uh, are we ultimately going to be able to replace this creature with this device on the right here, which is an organ on a chip? And the answer is no. I've been talking up these cell systems for many years. They're very powerful. But there are some features of disease that are hard to model in a Petri dish. This is because we're looking at complex tissues with complex functions, like cognition, like the functions that are affected in Dirk one a syndrome. Um, these are things, you know, brain organoids growing in a dish simply can't model. Uh, there are complex diseases involving multiple systems of the body, difficult to model. Often we have to take into account effects of the environment. And some diseases are chronic and, and there's interaction with the disease project process with aging. And that's very difficult to model in a dish. So we've got a new uh, cell genetics and disease modeling initiative going on at the JAX. And what it is, it's a cross-species platform that uses genetically diverse mouse and human cell lines. And the reason for that will become apparent as I go along for precision disease modeling. In our disease models, we really are focusing on rare diseases and rare variants in common disorders. We're using mouse stem cell models to link the human models in addition in vitro to whole organism studies. And we're developing screening platforms for drug discoveries. Um, why rare diseases and rare variants in common disorders? Well, as I'll show you, the JAX has a very strong track record and commitment in the area of rare diseases. Rare variants are great to study if, from a, a scientific point because they've got strong effects and are more likely to de degenerate reproducible phenotypes in cellular models. And often these rare variants operate on the same cells and the same gene networks as more common variants. So they're, they're really informative for us. Now, for some times, the JAX, the JAX has had a commitment to rare disease. This is our rare disease translational center. I'll tell you briefly about it. It's run by my colleague, Kat Lux. And really, they want to give an effective path from diagnosis to therapy. And uh, why rare diseases and why now you'll understand this. We now have diagnostic sequencing to understand a molecular basis of disease. We've got these new genetic tools that enable us to create models. And we've got new geno genomic therapies that involve, enable us to, to intervene directly in, in a powerful way. And this is just some of the uh, examples of this, uh, what this rare disease program is doing up at the JAXS now. For a long time, they focused on mouse models and then using those models to develop therapy. We're now coupling that with the human cell work. And that's what I'm going to illustrate for you today. Um, so mouse models are important, but they do sometimes fail. And one of the reasons is what we call a genetic N of one. So many people study one genetic inbred mouse strain, and that's like studying one person and expecting you uh, that that's going to tell you about all of humanity. So really what we're trying to do is use greater genetic diversity in our models to understand disease better. Um, so here's the outline of our approach. Um, we can take cell lines that are made from genetically diverse humans or mice. Uh, we can create the cell lines. We can introduce disease mutations into them, then turn them into the cell type of interest and interrogate them across a whole range of different platforms, whether they're functional, whether they're omics, whether they're imaging, and then understand which mouse genetic background is optimal to study the human disease. And I'm going to show you why that matters shortly. Um, and so this is going to be our general approach going forward to rare diseases. We'll take a patient. We'll obtain the sequencing information. We can make a stem cell model from that patient. We can correct the mutation so we have a control without the mutation. And then we can turn them into the relevant cell types 
uh, to study. We can do the same thing in mouse cells to create a mutation, and then we can study how different mouse strains line up with the human cells and enable us to select the right strain to study the disease. Um, so this is done through cellular phenotyping, whether it's functional or omics, uh, to, to get to the bottom of what's going on. And now why is genetic diversity important? As we'll see shortly, the genetic background of a human or a mouse makes a huge difference to what a disease mutation does. Uh, and there are, for instance, individuals walking around with familiar Alzheimer's disease mutations. Normally they would have got ill when they were in their 30s. Some of these individuals are cognitively normal way up into their 60s and 70s. And they're interesting experiments of nature because they have something in their makeup that protects them from disease development. And if we can find out what those things are, we'll learn more about how to intervene in disease process. So here's the features of the platform I'm going to describe to you. We engineer whatever mutation it is that we're interested in into genetically diverse mouse and human cells. Here we are taking them through the differentiation from stem cells to the early nervous system, to neurons, and then to fully mature neurons, examining their phenotype all along the way with these powerful techniques, and then saying, can, can we find the right mouse? So enables us to find the right mouse strain. Then we can discover factors that account for sensitivity and, sensitivity and resilience. We can use this in a high throughput way to look at millions of candidate disease genes, understand what's going on in the cell, that account for pathology, and then identify and validate new targets for diagnosis and intervention. Um, and we've been working on dirk one a is, a is like it was kind of fortuitous. We got interested in it. We were working on a particular chemical compound that came out of a screen, screen that happened to be a dirk one a inhibitor. Uh, but when we looked at this rare disease in our new cellular platform, we thought this is a great example. Um, and, you know, as you're probably aware, uh, we understand a fair bit about the genetics of autism spectrum disorder in general. Many candidate genes have been identified. There's been some mouse and human stem cell models, but not yet really impacting on therapy. So what we feel is there's a strong need of, for an integration of genetic studies, cell-based modeling, and whole organism work. So that's, that's what we're aiming at here. Um, now, you will be familiar with the clinical features of the Dirk one a syndrome, microcephaly, absent speech, delayed walking, et cetera. Um, half of individuals have received the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Many have some features of that, that, that spectrum disorder. Um, so we settled on studying Dirk one a as a proof of concept for our new, new platform. Uh, dirk one a affects a number of cellular processes. Uh, and as you're obviously aware, the number of copies in the genome has profound effects on multiple stages of development. So in Down syndrome, if you've got an extra copy of the gene, you have problems. You have one copy of the gene, you have a different set of problems. So this is a do what we call a dosage-sensitive syndrome implicated in severe autism syndrome and Down syndrome. Now, importantly, the severity of the haploinsufficiency syndrome, missing one copy, is variable in the human. We have this chemical inhibitor that enables us to, to study it, and there was a fair bit of history of study of this gene in the past. So for all these reasons, we thought it would be a good one to look at. And this just illustrates this, how, how genetic background can influence things. And these are just studies of a patient the mom and the dad looking at head circumference and various, uh, uh, you know, cognitive evaluations, IQ. And what you see is that looking across even this small series of patients, the severity of the problem can vary quite significantly clinically. Now, this is what we call a highly penetrant mutation. So individuals who have this mutation are likely to manifest some form of disease but the manifestation is variable. And more to the point, 
the, the outcome in the child depends a little bit on where you're starting with the parents. So there's something to do with genetic background there probably. So that autism spectrum in general is characterized by considerable cl cl clinical heterogeneity. That's one of the problems with it, even for highly penetrant rare variants. And that's why we're in, so interested in, in how the genetic background of the individual affects it. Um, so what we did was to build a platform in both mouse and human cells that enabled us to just walk through brain development uh, from the very beginning, the equivalent of the earliest cells in the embryo, through to these neural progenitors. Those are the precursors of the entire nervous system. They're going to be very important through to mature neurons. And in work we, we talked about, I won't talk about today, it's very interesting, we can also look at how net neurons respond to damage in this system. So you know that autism is a developmental disorder. That means it has its origins during brain, brain development, but it's got a complex behavioral phenotype. Now we can use stem cells and stem cell models to study brain development almost better than we can in the whole organism. Obviously we can't do it at all in the, in the developing human. But still, when we come to those behavioral features, we can't mimic that in a culture dish. So we really need some kind of whole organism model like the mouse to study that. Um, so I'm not gonna go into too many scientific details, but I just thought I'd show you a few pictures of what the system looks like. You can see we start with these stem cells here, and in a short period of time, uh, these, you know, kind of fibrous looking cells, those are all neurons with little processes connecting with one another. And we can show that they mature functionally. So don't worry about the details. This is just a recording of electrical activity across this uh, field of neurons. And it tells us they're talking to one another. So that's important. They've got function. And we can even make big cortical organoids. So uh, the important thing about this is that um, it works both in the human and mouse. It works on genetically diverse strains. So it's a very robust, flexible platform. And we even make brain organoids. I'm gonna play a little video for you. Organoids are the next generation of stem cell models. They go from a 2D culture in a flat dish to a three-dimensional culture. And I'll just show you this because it's fine. To... These are human brain organoids growing in what we call a paddle wheel bioreactor. So each one of those is, I hate to use the word, but a little mini brain. And the important thing about those is that they develop not only the cell types, but they also get organized in the way they would be in the brain. So this, this structure here, this round structure with a hole in the middle, that's like the early developing brain, the neural tube. So this technology enables us to go to an even higher level of sophistication. And we use that in our studies some as well. Um, so the first thing that we learned when we studied a bunch of different mouse strains is that the strains respond differently to DERK1A. Now, one of the most important effects of DERK1A is to slow the growth of those precursors of all the nervous systems. And you can see this little black red square uh, down this row. This is a measure of cell proliferation. You see this one strain B6, big stop sign. And we can confirm that this is just the uh, control and there's the B6 line growing much slower. But look at these other strains, one, two, nine, much less effective. Um, and that inhibition of these neural precursors, which is so important to the growth of the brain during development, that's exactly what we see in the human cells when we knock out this gene. And so you can see the human cells with the knockout slowing down. And this is just a, a, a kind of figure showing that they are stopping their growth. Um, so what this tells us is, is something important, that there are differences between these two mouse strains in terms of the way they respond to the loss of DERK1A. So in this C57 black strain, uh, the whole process of neural development is really stopped at this stage. Whereas in the 129 strain, they continue to grow and develop as normal. Um, so 
at least in the culture dish, we can see a profound difference in the way these two mouse strains with different genetic backgrounds respond to dirk one a inhibition. So this shows the outcome in the animal in a little bit more detail. Don't worry about the detail. What I'm gonna tell you very simply is, if we knock out this gene in this strain, we get no live born mice. In other words, it's that serious that the embryos don't even develop to term. Now, when we take that same knockout and put it on the 129 background, same genetic lesion, those mice are born just fine and they are totally normal. But to get a human model, we can cross those two strains and then we get something that uh, live animals that kind of copy the Dirk 1A syndrome. So that just shows you the profound effect of genetic background. So that enabled us to say, this is the right model to use uh, and, and identify these strain difference. But what can we learn from that? Well, so we reason that, well, if there's a difference, such a profound difference between these two mouse strains, the way they respond, um, let's go through the process again um, and let's look at where they vary at the molecular level. And it turns out there is a very important variation and a very important signaling pathway for brain development, the BDNF pathway. And again, uh, this is just uh, molecular biology. You don't need to worry about it too much. But the bottom line is this is a schematic representation of the gene in the resistant strain. Resistant strain. And it's full length and you get a whole good protein from this gene. Whereas in the strain, the sensitive, um, the, the message for this gene is altered such that you don't produce the full length protein and the tail end of it is missing. And that's important because this is the bit that is important for signaling within the cell. Um, so basically, if we knock this gene out or inhibit, it, inhibit, inhibit the protein, um, we shift the, the, the form of the, the gene that's expressed from one that is normal to one that lacks signaling capacity. And this is, turns out to be what we call a receptor, a signaling molecule for a very important gene in brain development. So um, here is a schematic of that that's a little bit simpler. Um, here's the normal situation in the uh, 129 mouse. Uh, this compound binds to the receptor on the surface of the cell and sends a signal. Uh, in the strain that is susceptible to the mutation, it's lacking the signaling bit, so the signaling doesn't work. You've got all sorts of problems. Here, can we envision uh, making some sort of drug or some sort of molecular approach to bypass that problem and reinstate signaling in the affected animals? So that's kind of where we, we, we've gone with this and we can think of a couple strategies whereby uh, we could develop this concept. First of all, of course, we'll have to show that we see the same thing in the human cells. We haven't got around to that. But that just shows you how a comparison of these two sensitive and resistant animal strains can give us insights into what's going on at the molecular level and how we might be able to intervene. So to summarize what came out of this work, uh, we've developed this robust cross-species platform that we think is gonna be useful in a number of cases of rare diseases. Uh, we showed that there are profound mouse strain differences in how they respond to haploinsufficiency in DERK 1A. And that if we look in the culture dish, that tells us important information about the whole animal. It enables us to identify the right genetic background. But importantly, if we compare the sensitive and resistant strains in a dish, we can identify a potentially drug, druggable target for therapeutic in, intervention. And the message here is that diversity in our cell culture models really helps us guide the development of precision disease models. Now, many of you will be aware it's very, very important that we incorporate diversity into the models we use in biomedical science. That's important for ethical reasons, 
from the standpoint of ensuring equity of access to these new uh, developments and new discoveries and potential new therapies. But it's also, as I've just shown you, very scientifically important because genetic variation is there. It modifies how animals respond to particular disease mutations, and it can tell us a lot about the basis of disease. So these are the key features of our precision platform, returning to it again. It's an in vivo, in vitro platform, close comparison of mouse and humans, uh, enabling us to identify good strains for modeling disease. When we have a good strain that models the disease, then we have a strain that we can use to test interventions. And also this whole thing about understanding why some animals are resilient and some are sensitive. In the mouse, the genetics enables us to find out what's behind that very quickly. Um, so we think we've got a very powerful tool here. And I hope that what we found uh, is helpful at some stage uh, to patients with this disease, because that's really why we're here to do. And we've set this up so to empower our rare disease uh, program to, to do more faster. So I'll stop there and take any questions. I hope that wasn't, you know, too uh, hard for you to follow scientifically. But if there's anything you didn't get, please go ahead and ask me. Well, thanks, Martin, so much for uh, that presentation. Just really fascinating look at the importance of genetic diversity and and how you know the Dervorn ACE um, might be you know, manifested phenotypically. So based upon the data that you have, um, so would you say that the, there is this significant importance of activation of the BNF receptor? Is that kind of like one of the conclusions that, that you have from for this model system in terms of Dervorn A alkylase efficiency? Yes, yes. So there there was some prior evidence to in, in implicate the BDNF pathway from unrelated studies done previously. Uh, we certainly identify that pathway, but the important thing to understand about our results is that it tells you how you're going to have to intervene because adding BDNF to this system won't do any good. That's not where the problem is. The problem is in the receptor that responds to BDNF. And there are drugs that could bypass that receptor. And since it's, uh, I'm gonna get a little bit technical now, since it's a, a, a disorder of the way the gene is spliced in the sensitive animal, there are molecular approaches to correcting the splice so there are at least a couple leads, but before I went any further, I'd really have to go back and look in the, across a panel of human cell lines and see, and we think we can see sensitivity and resilience. Does that relate to the same phenomena that we see in the mouse? Yes. Yeah, that was gonna be one of my follow-up questions, was just really related to if you have the ability to get clinical data um, or, um, you know, clinical notes that would uh, allude more to how uh, Dirt 1A is presented um, uh, from severity, as you mentioned, you know, if there's yeah. sort of yeah. less severe uh, patients or, you know, that have, might have that uh, BDNF, you know, receptor activation. So uh, I feel versus, if I were to address this, um, what I would probably do, we have panels of genetically diverse human cell lines. And I would begin by simply doing the same simple assay we did for neural progenitor growth across a diverse panel of human cell lines. And I'm willing to bet you uh, that would, we would see a spectrum of response. And if we could then relate that to this BDNF splicing, that would be encouraging. And then we could undertake experiments to say, well, if you rectify it, um, does that make the cell resistant? Even if we just found a sensitive line and interfered with the BDNF in that way, um, maybe we'd, we'd learn something there. Yeah. Do we have any other questions during the audience or uh, folks online? If you can, you, you 
be able to ask questions in the chat or in the q a channel we are monitoring that so feel free to ask any question too what's the timeline of all this is this in early development uh, what's the timeline when all this, the everything you're talking about, is really an early development of the embryo? Yes, yes, it would be early embryonic development so that, um, uh, you know, in the mouse model, what goes on uh, goes on early. However, um, you know, with a lot of these neurodevelopmental disorders, there's been an unfortunate assumption, in my view, um, that, okay, a lot went wrong when... Um, during embryogenesis, you're stuck with it. Well, here's the thing. The human nervous system continues to develop well after birth into the second decade of life. We know that we still have capacity for making new neurons uh, in early life. Um, I, I, I feel strongly that we ought to take the view that, um, you know, uh, maybe we can intervene and correct these things, even though a fair bit of it may, trouble may have occurred during embryonic development. So that's my view. I mean, it's just a, an opinion, uh, but I think there's sound biological grounds for having a go at that sort of intervention. Okay, thank you. Are we shy, another question? Sorry, Martin, I'm just going to keep go ahead and ask you. I probably ask you questions all night, but, um, you know, just based upon what you, what you just said and, and having that, um, as you described, sort of that neuroplasticity uh, continuing to occur um, or in, in early life. I mean, and based upon your background, what you've done at, at Jackson Labs, I mean, do you have any thoughts, ideas on, on really how to test that? Because, you know, where we're at right now, you know, all of all these children and adults, um, you know, that have, that have birth one A syndrome. I mean, that's what we're testing is whether, you know, correction or, um, you know, treatment with something like, you know, an active BDNF or anything like to have data or to show that we can, you know, increase neuron development and, you know, increase activity in the brain. So do you have any thoughts, ideas on, modeling that or what what next steps can be to kind of test that well i i think you could what i would do first is confirm the mechanism um, in human cells and if that played out i i would probably um honestly go back to our mouse model and begin a very early age intervention and uh, this is something that is relatively straightforward to do once you identified the correct strategy, of course, because there, there are different possibilities. And then uh, uh, just see, uh, because um, uh, once we arrived at the right model, the kind of cross between the totally resistant, totally sensitive strain, um, you've then got mice that are, are born with the defect, uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, have some capacity, they, they, they're, certainly live and and you could intervene and say well if we try and promote neurogenesis or even you know not even making new neurons but just enabling those neurons that are there to develop in a nor more normal fashion i didn't show you the data but the the mutation also interferes with later stages of neural maturation let's try and intervene let's see what happens and we, we can do that, you, you know, in this in vitro system first to say, once you're past neurogenesis, if we then interfere with the pathway that's the problem, can we help those neurons wire up better or what have you? So I, I can, I, I, I just think, um, I don't think we should just abandon these types of disorders simply because, uh, well, you know, some things went wrong during development. You know, the human nervous system is still developing for some time after birth. So that that would be my view. Hi, Martin. Craig. 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 Um, lovely talk. Uh, I'm, I'm of the same opinion. 
uh, regarding neuroplasticity. Uh, I think there's some exciting work coming out of some Angevin trials where they're um, looking at regaining a bit of uh, IQ uh, and a bit of um, motor function as well. The other question I want to ask, because Dirk one is so pervasive um, in its ability to phosphorylate and obviously uh, I think other um, organelles, did you see any other differences in non-neurological -neuro uh, areas of the mice or what did you plan on looking at them? Well, um, I, our colleague who did this work, and as I say, I'm not an expert on, on uh, mouse neuroscience, our colleague who did this work was mainly focused on anatomical and behavioral disorders. So there, there may be other aspects of uh, that mouse phenotype that would be informative to some of these comorbidities associated with the syndrome, but it, it simply wasn't examined in detail. Though it's there to look for, for sure. I, I mean, one of, you raise an important point though. One of the hard things to work on uh, with this particular gene is that the enzyme is so pervasive in the processes, you know, it's, it modifies so many different key processes that um, uh, it, it makes it hard to nail down one biochemical uh, 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 thing to function, to zero in on. But uh, if I had to start, it might be with BDNF signaling. Um, so, how is different than human brain? So, so um, th there are real important differences between the mouse and human brain and its structure and how it develops. Um, the mouse brain is rather smooth compared to the human brain that has many folds in the cortex that expand its area normally, uh, enormously. Uh, but that said, some of the basic processes of brain development are, are similar in the two species. So the fundamental cellular processes are quite similar. And that's why we can learn something useful from the mice. But our idea is that really uh, we can use the two in a complementary fashion. We can use the human cells to study aspects of human brain development that may be missing in the mouse. And so that's why the cell models are important. I didn't really go into our organoids, but they give us a, a kind of rough caricature of the development of the whole human brain. So that's the nice thing about those models. And uh, uh, we, we can look at those human specific features now in a way that we couldn't 10 years ago. But you're absolutely right. There are important differences, but nature has been very conservative in evolution has retained a lot of features of development that are very similar across species. So um, it's a mixed bag, but, but the tools we have now to look at those differences and understand them are, are much better than they used to be. And I, I think Luke was also asking maybe what some of the differences are between the jerk one a syndrome brain or even in the jerk one a haploinsufficiency or in the brain organoids that you've seen and like wild type, like what are, you know, we know that clinically, you know, it said, you know, microcephaly, but like, what are some of those other maybe nuances within the brain that are different than wild Yeah, type? sure. So I can speak to our studies a little bit. There are specific brain regions that are affected more than others in the mouse, but um, I didn't, I, I just focused in on what we call neurogenesis. That's the growth of the brain. Uh, but we also looked at how the neurons mature. And we can do that by seeing uh, uh, as they develop, how they learn to fire electrical activity and how they learn to talk to one another and form circuits. And that process is delayed in the DERK 1A neurons, uh, which are modeling the brain. Um, it's delayed 
some strains eventually catch up. Others, like the, the sensitive B6, never seem to. They never, never kind of get to the same level of activity. But of course, the B6 in that animal, it's a lethal mutation. They don't go much beyond early development. So um, there's functional maturation defects. The other thing we can do, I told you, we looked at the ability of neurons to regrow the, what we call their axons, the bits that reach out and connect with a DERK 1A loss inhibits that ability as well to different degrees and different strains. And that may be significant as, as uh, uh, you know, the, the nerves form connections uh, during development or even during repair of the central nervous system. So there are a number of aspects that uh, I didn't go into them all, but um, there are a number of aspects uh, that are different. I highlighted the neurogenesis because it's, it's a key effect of, of loss of the gene and, uh, and quite an important and striking one. And I, I promise this, this will be my last question, but, you know, one of the important uh, aspects that, that we're trying to um, look at within the MSAP also is like the genotype type correlation, um, you know, that we have this DERP1A gene, there's all these mutations across, you know, within some of these regions, and, and we're looking at, you know, whether those mutations correlate to, you know, severity, for instance, but it sounds like what you're saying is that, you know, it's not as simple as that, you know, it's not just about the mutation and potentially the, the resulting severity of phenotype. There's a genetic background to that yes. outside of just jerk one a itself, you know, maybe related to the DNF pathway, maybe there's other pathways involved as well. So, you know, I think, you know, maybe as we, go forward in trying to better understand genotype, genotype correlations, like how would we take into consideration some of that genetic diversity, that genetic value? Yeah, sure. So um, you're right. There's a number of mutations across the uh, coding sequence of the protein. Um, they may account for different phenotype, but what I would say is that with the cell-based systems and particular using CRISPR, um, we can go through to fairly high throughput format, um, and what we would do, of course, would be to introduce a variety of the mutations into a variety of genetic backgrounds, take them through the process I illustrated briefly to you, and maybe a particular mutation has an effect on late maturation rather than neurogenesis, or maybe the genetic background dictates whether neurogenesis versus maturation is more effective. Um, the, the point about the cellular systems is that they scale up um, and they can incorporate different genetic backgrounds and we can do facile genetic manipulation. So I think in principle, those important questions that you ask can be answered. Well, you know, I know it's late for you, Mark, when you're in, you're in Germany. We really appreciate the time that, that you've given to us uh, to present and 